a spring semester colloquium series for, for Duke physics. Um, and we have, we expect to have six uh, speakers this semester, roughly every other week with one, one week being skipped in March. Um, I wanna make special mention of uh, the February 10th colloquium, which is our next one. I guess that's three weeks from now. Um, the, that one is gonna be held at a special time. It's gonna be a lunchtime colloquium uh, by Sarah Bridal, who, who uh, has a very interesting background. She's a cosmologist, astrophysicist by training, who's now working on uh, food and climate issues. Um, but she's in the UK and, and was not able to join us at our usual time. So we're gonna um, you know, watch, watch your email. You'll see advertisements for a lunchtime colloquium at, at noon on February 10th. Um, the, by now, I think everybody's aware of how Zoom works. Please keep, uh, keep yourself muted um, unless you want to, um, you know, except when you are recognized to speak. If you have questions during the colloquium itself, please put them in the chat and I will monitor the chat. And for, for questions that require really long discussion, We'll, we'll hold them until after the talk, but for points of clarification, quick questions, um, I'll monitor the chat and, and interrupt the speaker if necessary. Um, and otherwise, um, let's, let's just sit back and enjoy the talk. I'll turn it over to uh, Stefan Boss to introduce our speaker. Yes, hi, welcome everyone. Sorry, Kristen, you could start the recording if you haven't. Thanks. All right, welcome to our first uh, physics colloquium of the semester. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Professor Norbert Linke. Uh, Norbert got his uh, master's degree in Germany at the University of Ulm and proceeded then to Oxford, UK, where he got um, his PhD in the group of uh, Professor Lucas on um, ion traps. Uh, he then came to the US and joined Chris Monroe in Maryland, first as a postdoc, subsequently as a faculty research scientist, and since 2019 as an assistant professor of physics and fellow of the Joint Quantum Institute. Um, as you are all aware, we are building a world-class effort in quantum computing at Duke, and we are very interested in learning what Norbert has to teach us. Uh, Norbert, please go ahead and tell us about uh, your quantum architecture based on trapped ions. Thank you very much, much, Stefan. This was a very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, today I'll be talking about a quantum architecture based on trapped ions. Um, some of you may ask why not a quantum computer based on trapped ions, and uh, that'll become clear later. I'll basically try and explain how trapped ions are useful both for doing uh, quantum algorithms and computation. You can see an example here of a quantum walk done uh, with quantum gates in a quantum computer. But I think there are opportunities to also use additional degrees of freedom that trapped ions provide um, for quantum simulation and other applications. So here's a sort of overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, I'll introduce why it is such a good idea to use ions for uh, quantum computing and simulation applications. I'll briefly introduce the experimental system that um, I'm working with at Maryland, um, which consists of a number of individually trapped ytterbium ions. And then I'll give a couple of examples of quantum algorithms. One is this quantum walk and how a quantum walk can be used to um, actually simulate the, the Dirac equation. Um, secondly, a connection maybe to um, high energy physics, which is how can we do simple quantum field theory um, simulations using a quantum computer. And then I will change to analog simulations where I'll talk about um, phonon hopping, motional quanta, if you like, that you can use for simulations and paraparticles, which is kind of an exotic um, uh, quantum physics um, exploration. And finally, I'll give a brief outlook on a new type of trap that I'm working on and a quantum network experiment. Okay, so why is it such a good idea to 
use ions to make a quantum computer? Well, um, for a quantum computer, we need these quantum uh, particles that are very well controlled. And um, of course, a single atom is as clean a quantum system as you're going to find. Um, there are energy levels in atoms, of course, which we can use as our qubit states. Um, and we can interact with these uh, with laser light. We can detect the light that comes from them to learn about their state. And uh, typically, this is visible or UV light. So we can basically hold these in a room temperature environment um, and still cleanly interact with them. Uh, what's nice about atoms, of course, is that they are standards, which means each atom of a given species is identical. So if you want to add more qubits to your system, you can add more atoms, and they are all the same uh, by nature. Now, um, I said, on the one hand, we want this very clean, isolated system. On the other hand, we want to do computation, so we need some strong interactions. And the great thing about ions is they are charged atoms, so they interact strongly by the Coulomb interaction. So if we trap them in a common harmonic potential, they will form these uh, modes of motion, just like modes on a guitar string. Um, and these are, this is a shared sort of quantum deg degree of freedom that we can use to create interactions between them. Um, so what is the vision for ion trap quantum computing? Well, the idea is you have some kind of modular ion trap where you can store, interact a large number of ions to build a computation. Of course, maybe this is not infinitely large. So you could think about this as a module in a even larger system where you use photonic interconnects. And so, uh, are we there yet? Well, we're not. Uh, the challenges are higher fidelity operations. We need to control these qubits better. Uh, we need to control more ions and increasingly also a classical control of these systems as they grow uh, are a challenge. And um, the good thing though is that qubit quality is not on the list. The qubits are basically given by nature. They're in this very clean, naturally quantum system. Um, and that is, that's why these are a good starting point. Um, so this is the, the quantum hardware or the, well, the experiment that I'm using at the University of Maryland. This is a, an RF pole trap. This is about an inch um, corner to corner. This holder here, you can see these sort of razor blade shaped electrodes. They form a, um, a RF confining potential along this uh, in this plane. So the ions are dynamically trapped in the center here. And uh, this is a side view. You can see there's these segments. And so we have a weak, a weak static electric potential along this axis. And this allows us to trap a small number of uh, ions um, in a very controlled way in this ion chain. Um, so this is a level structure of ytterbium. A lot of levels, you only need to look at these two here, which is what we use as our qubit states in the ground level. And they have the nice property that they are magnetic field insensitive, which means that to first order, um, they're, they're, the qubit states uh, don't change when the magnetic field fluctuates. And that gives us very long coherence times even without having to stabilize the field very much. Um, so we need some more ingredients to build a quantum computer. That is a way to initialize and to read out the uh, qubits. And for that, we use this transition near 370 nanometers. And so the way it works is we shine in a certain frequency of light, which clears out these three states here and initializes our qubit in state zero. Then if you want to read out, we do this by state dependent fluorescence. So if the qubit is in state one, we can drive this cycling transition and collect these photons. If it is in state zero, the ion is dark and um, we don't get any light. And so we can discriminate these two qubit states um, with pretty high fidelity. I should say also that uh, one of your colleagues at Duke, Jung San Kim, basically has the record for this, reading out this qubit with um, four nines um, of fidelity. Um, this is just a matter of um, engineering the system better in order to collect more of these photons and uh, more efficiently read out the, uh, the qubit state. We need one more ingredient, which is a way to coherently manipulate the qubits. And for that, we use a Raman laser scheme. As we can see these two beams at 355 nanometers, they are detuned from these upper levels, but they are detuned from each other by this qubit splitting of 12 gigahertz. And that means we can coherently drive these transitions. And the way this works is the beam is actually a, a frequency comb, a pulsed laser. It has many frequency components. We split it in two and shift it in such a way that each of these frequencies interferes with the 107th neighbor from the other half to give you exactly a beat note at 12.6 gigahertz that can drive this, um, this transition. Okay, so this is kind of the basic ingredients. Uh, how does that turn into a quantum computer or a you know, programmable quantum system? And so for that, you need uh, what computer scientists call the stack. So you, you wanna um, run a certain quantum algorithm that typically comes written down as standard computational gates which a compiler breaks down into native gates, which are then applied as laser pulses on your actual physical hardware. And so I'll very briefly mention how each of these uh, steps is realized, starting at the bottom here. 
Um, and so here you can see kind of a sketch of the setup. The trap is not shown. Each of these dots is uh, an individual ion. And um, these purple objects here are the two laser beams that I introduced on the previous slide. One of them hits the entire chain. And the second one is split into many beams, each of which is focused onto exactly one ion. And you can see these beams are counter propagating. So if we are absorbing from one beam and emitting into the other, we are um, basically transmitting or transferring uh, some momentum onto the ion chain, which will be important to drive the ion's motion, which I'll mention um, uh, shortly. Um, but also what's nice is since we have individual control over each of these beams, amplitude, frequency, and phase, we can basically tell very precisely what signal is seen by each of these individual ions. And we can use that to make uh, create quantum gates. Now to read out, we image this ion chain onto a detector array. So each ion has its own detector of light. So we can tell for each ion, whether it's bright or dark at the end of a computation or for each qubit, whether it's in state zero or state one. Okay, moving up one step. What are the native operations or the quantum gates that we can run in the system? The first one's very simple. We turn on one of the individual beams and the global beam, and we can rotate each qubit on the Bloch sphere. So we choose the phase of the um, laser pulse that we apply that gives us the axis on the equator that we rotate around, and we can choose the duration, which gives us the rotation angle. And so that in the, in the qubit basis leads to this gate, which has two parameters, phase and, um, and uh, rotation angle. Okay, more interestingly, how do we create an entanglement in the system? I mentioned earlier that the ions share these motional modes here. Um, and that is kind of a shared quantum resource that we can use to create entanglement. So the carrier means we resonantly drive the ion, um, the Rabi flops that I showed on the previous slide. That's this, this graph here, resonant um, driving. But if you go off resonant by a motional frequency, you can see these sidebands. A blue sideband means you're changing the qubit state and you're also adding a quantum of motion to one of those modes. And it turns out if you send a laser beam near the red and blue sideband simultaneously, you'll drive an interaction that looks like this. Um, this D is basically a displacement in phase space. So you get a spin motion entanglement and a spin spin term. And if we um, shape these pulses correctly, we can actually um, zero this term out and be left with a pure spin spin easing like interaction. And if we choose this prefactor correctly, um, we can turn this gate into a um, operation that creates a uh, maximally entangled state. So a bell type state between any two qubits. Now all the ions move as you can see here, but only the two ions that have the laser beam applied actually participate in the spin evolution. So only those two are entangled. So we can selectively choose uh, to which ions we apply this entangling gates. And because all the ions move in these modes, um, this creates an all to all connectivity. So I'm showing nine here because that's kind of the largest um, system that we've been working with in my lab. Each of these gray lines is a potential two qubit gate that you can apply. And the more of these connections you have, the easier it is to map certain applications or map any applications to your hardware because you don't have to copy information around to realize certain connections. They are kind of directly available. Okay, I'll move up one more layer. Um, we use these basic gates to provide basically a library of computational gates. I'll show one example, which is called the Fretkin gate or controlled swap gate. And um, what it does is it swaps the state of these two qubits if this qubit is one, and this is the truth table for this gate. And you can write down this gate as a circuit. Now, I don't want you to look at all the details. What matters is that each of these boxes is either a two qubit gate or a single qubit gate like introduced earlier. So this sequence altogether forms this um, Fretkin gate. And of course, these factors here, they need to be calibrated and so on. But if you do that, you can play this sequence back and get a Fretkin gate out. You can see here input state versus output state and you get a um, pattern that looks like the truth table that I showed before. Uh, the fidelity here is kind of uh, high 80s. And um, the biggest cause of error in our system are these two qubit gates. There are seven of them in the system. And um, this number tells you that we you know, do these gates with roughly one to 2% um, error. Okay, so now we have basically reached the, uh, the top layer and we can specify um, different quantum algorithms and realize them. And so for the first time we uh, managed to do this in the lab was in 2016. And uh, after we published kind of the first uh, paper with a few demonstration algorithms, something very interesting happened, which is that sort of an avalanche of collaboration started with various different people contacting us and trying to run their favorite um, quantum algorithm. And you think, you know, why are they doing this? They can get the answer because it's you know, a small quantum computer. They can get the answer on their own computer. But it turns out um, 
testing your ideas on a real system and getting some feedback from a real um, quantum computer is valuable enough that actually these collaborations have only increased. And so since uh, this year, there's actually a third page to this also of uh, different applications going on. Um, I'll pick out a couple that um, I'll be talking about today. One is this quantum walk. And the second one is a collaboration with uh, Zora Davudi um, on the Schwinger model simulation, um, because that's related to high energy physics, which I know many of you are interested in. Um, okay, I'll, uh, I'll talk about the first application, which are these quantum walks. Um, now, quantum walks, of course, are the quantum version of classical random walks. And a random walk is a game by which you flip a coin and you take a step forward or back depending on the result. And so there's classical random walks and there's the quantum version where of course things can go into superposition of going left and right uh, simultaneously. And you get very different distribution from a quantum to a classical random walk because there's interference effects. And it turns out these have many applications um, you know, in transport problems or simulations of other, other uh, quantum systems. Um, I point out there are other trapped ion implementations that are using uh, kind of phase space of the ions to do the quantum walk. But here we're realizing a sort of algorithmic quantum walk as a quantum circuit. And so the way this works is you have a state space that consists of the position uh, and a coin. And you then apply this operator that consists of the coin flip and shift on some initial state. Um, so here's a, a representation of the coin operator. It's just a, a single qubit um, rotation. The theta um, represents the weight of this coin. And then there's a shift operator. You can see there's two terms to it. The first is if the coin lands on zero, you go to the left. If the coin lands on one, or heads or tails, um, you move to the right. Um, and so this is what the algorithm then looks like. You start um, have coin and position space, and then you apply these um, step or shift operators consecutively, and then you measure the, the output distribution. So how should you encode this position space, right? One way to do it would be you'd say, okay, I have n qubits, I'll just use one qubit per position. But that wouldn't be very efficient because um, of course you'll waste a lot of um, Hilbert space basically that is not used. So in our case, we used five qubits and we mapped 15 different position states. And here you can see, um, you can see these sort of binary numbers. Um, even states have a zero at the end and odd states are one, but otherwise, they're kind of distributed along this um, uh, position space. And so here's what the actual circuit then looks like for step one to five. Um, and you can see it consists of a coin toss operator and some shift operations. And this is what it looks like in computational gates, like C knots and, and CC knots. But it turns out you can compress these a little bit more um, because we have this um, two qubit easing gate that I introduced earlier, we actually have a parameter. We can maximally entangle two ions or we can sort of partially entangle them. And that means we can create um, C naught gates, which is maximally entangling or square root of C naught, which is this V here. And with this flexibility, you can actually turn these code blocks into, a, into circuits that uh, require a lot fewer gates than, um, than implementing these computational gates directly would. Okay, I'll just jump to the results. You can see experiment is on the right. Uh, simulation on the left and here's for different weights of the coin uh, sorry for different uh, initial state of the coin so um, different biases of the coin if we initialize in zero we mostly walk left initialize in right in one we mostly walk right and if we initialize in a superposition we get also a superposition of walking left and right in the output so this is a nice quantum walk but i said earlier that also you can use quantum walks in order to uh, do physics simulation. And this is where this Dirac cellular automaton comes in. So a cellular automaton is just a particle that does a walk, but as it's doing the walk, it behaves as if it is um, subject to some uh, equation of motion, or in this case, the Dirac equation. So for this, we have to modify the, the quantum walk very slightly. Theory is given in this paper. So we're gonna do a split step quantum walk. So we're gonna have two coins. The first coin tells me, should I stand still or move forward? And the second coin tells me, shall I stand still or move backward. And so the shift operators look like this, um, very similar to before. So you have a step backwards, um, stand still and a step forward term for the two uh, shifts. And um, you can actually write down this kind of shift interaction or shift action by these operators in a, a differential equation with two terms, one for the left and right moving wave function, um, where these kind of um, um, depend on the wave function where it is now and on the previous state of the wave function. So this corresponds to the shift left and right, and this corresponds to the current position. And it turns out this differential equation um, 
for different certain conditions of these angles matches either the massless Dirac equation or the massive Dirac equation. And so this turns into a Dirac cellular automaton because if you choose these angles correctly, the little walker basically acts like a Dirac particle. And so um, that just means we have to run a very similar circuit, except we now have two different coins, theta one and theta two. Okay, and so here are the results for different masses of this Dirac particle. So if we choose a very light mass down here, for example, we can see the particle just zooms away at the speed of light. However, if we choose a heavier mass, you can see this here, the particle kind of st stands, uh, sticks around in the middle and interferes with itself. Uh, and that gives you this pattern here. And so this is a nice example of how you know, an algorithm, a quantum algorithm can actually turn into a, a quantum physics simulation on a quantum computer. Um, okay, I'll move on to another example. Maybe I'll pause br briefly if there's questions. Okay, if not, um, I'll, um, I'll move on to the Schwinger model. And so this is a collaboration with uh, Zora da Bruno. No, no, actually, I have a question. Sure. Um, this is for a particle at rest. Could you make a particle um, start out in a state that's already moving? Um, I think this particle here is moving. No, this one look moves out. I see. Okay. Space. Yeah. Um, it it has kind of an initial momentum, which is given by the initial conditions, but if you make the mass heavier, it's kind of not really moving very far. Um, and therefore you get these fringes um, of interference as it moves back and forth. Okay, so, so it's at momentum zero initialized. Um, no, I think it has some no. finite momentum. Um, finite momentum, okay, yeah. thank you. Um, I don't remember exactly what, how it, in what, uh, what the momentum is, but it's initialized at finite momentum, yeah, that's right. I was curious if you could generalize this to doing sort of Markov chain Monte Carlo type calculations or if it's only a very specific sort of action that allows you to do the walking around. Um, no, you could, um, to do that, I think you would have to initialize multiple walkers. Um, that means the, uh, the circuits would be more complicated, um, but you could probably have that interference of different walkers um, as well in this quantum walk framework. Thanks. We kind of took advantage of the fact that we only start one walker. You can see the circuits are very simple in the beginning because there's only positions where the walker can be, right? There's only very few in the beginning and then it gets more complicated. Um, and this is what kind of made it possible to run this kind of deep uh, or relatively deep uh, um, simulation with these five steps. Okay, I'll move on to a, uh, another simulation uh, from the topic of uh, high energy physics. This is a collaboration with Zora Davudi at uh, University of Maryland. And so the idea is, is it possible to um, simulate a uh, lattice Schwinger model on a quantum computer. And so this is a uh, quantum field theory spinless in uh, one plus one D uh, on a discretized space. And so this is the Hamiltonian. You can uh, map it onto spins. Um, and in order to do that, you're gonna have different uh, lattice sites, uh, which either represent a vacuum or a positron or a vacuum and an electron, which means you need two qubits per site. And this is gonna be represented in this uh, spin chain and in order to realize this, you have to basically translate the Hamiltonian to the spin Hamiltonian via jordan wigner transformation. Um, you make a uh, sort of gauge choice. And um, another sort of complexity that you have to deal with is these uh, sort of gauge links. And so um, here we use Gauss's law, uh, which basically gives us a certain uh, conserved quantity, which means that in the spin basis, uh, the number of spin ups or the number of qubits in spin up is conserved as the uh, as the um, uh, simulation progresses, it means making this, uh, using this means that there's gonna be some long range interactions in the qubit basis. You're gonna see this on the, on the qubit Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian in the actual qubit basis, which has a mass term, a hopping term and this E field interaction. And you can see here as the square and these sums, and this means there's gonna be sigma Z, sigma Z terms between um, non neighboring uh, qubits. And so this is obviously gonna make the circuit more complex as the, um, system grows, but we have the advantage that we have some long range interactions available in our, our trap down system. And so this is the, the simplest version, just one side, one side means two qubit, um, one positron, one electron. This is what one trotter, this is what one uh, trotter step looks like. And um, you can see this is the uh, exact dynamics is the straight line. Trotterized means broken down into steps. 
very similar. And then you have this experimental data, which you can see decays here. So this is 20 steps. So this is uh, over 40 entangling gates and this decays down. Um, but because of the symmetry, because we know that we only have an even number of spin ups, we can actually post select the data, which means when the simulation leaves the allowed space by symmetry, you can uh, discard it. And that's the, the points here in green. And you can see um, basically all the way to the last flop, you can sort of represent this um, evolution very well, which represents pair creation and annihilation in this um, Schwinger model system. Of course, this is the simplest version. So um, this is kind of the next step up, two sides. You can see we're getting some non-nearest neighbor interaction. And here there's some other choices that come in, which is how do you break this Hamiltonian down into circuits? So here we've ordered it all the X gates, uh, sorry, then sort of X, 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 and then here we move into the Y basis and then into the Z basis. Um, there's other ways you can trotterize. So this is not data, this is just a simulation. This is exact, and this is just by ordering these terms differently within the circuit. Um, and so this is the circuit that I showed, but it turns out if you um, order it by even and odd um, interactions, uh, you can get slightly better match to the exact um, um, evolution. And so this is what we chose to do in the actual circuit. And so you can see this is the results. I guess, again, yellow is the raw data. And after post-selection, this, um, this is the data that we get. So you can see it still decays, of course, doesn't match things very well. However, we do get three flops represented in the data. This is 10 cycles. Each cycle you can see has nine entangling gates. So this is after 90 entangling gates, we're still getting something you know, that corresponds to the real evolution, uh, which I guess maybe from a high energy physics perspective, um, you'd say this is a very simple model. But it turns out uh, for us, this is a very challenging um, simulation because adding more qubits here wouldn't necessarily help you very much. Uh, what you really need is a, a better um, gate quality to realize these deep uh, evolutions. So they are, this is kind of a collaboration that both inspires uh, you know, better maybe symmetry protected error correction on the side of the theory, as well as inspires us to improve our system to allow these uh, sort of deep uh, quantum simulations. Okay, this is for three sites. We haven't actually done this. I'm just gonna show you the circuit. Um, so you can see that these uh, get more complex, more and um, more non-nearest neighbor interactions. Also the circuit doesn't fit on one slide anymore. So this is just one shorter step. Um, and so this is the um, expected um, output. Um, we haven't taken the data yet. We have to kind of upgrade our controller to make this possible, but hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll, we'll have some data on that too. Um, Okay, um, I have a, a short second sort of high energy physics topic, which is scattering a, in a quantum easing model. And so um, this is also kind of a very um, simple version of a quantum field theory. And um, we're gonna choose this four side single particle uh, quantum easing model and um, study a scattering process. And so in order to scatter, we're gonna add a potential barrier. And so we're gonna compare a uh, two qubit system where we initialize a particle that either hits the barrier or does not hit the barrier. So we initialize this state, uh, which basically has a forward momentum. And then we're gonna measure what is the momentum um, going backwards in order to see what is the phase shift with and without this potential barrier. This is a collaboration with uh, Yannick Maurice at um, University of Iowa. And so this is the uh, circuit that we have to do. Uh, this is the state preparation of this state moving forward. This is the trotter evolution, either with or without this um, potential barrier term. And then we do a quantum Fourier transform to find the momentum states. So you're gonna have forward and backward momentum mapped to these two states. Um, and so this is the result. Um, there are basically look at the curves first. So this is the, the um, interacting evolution. So here's the barrier. So that means the, the backwards momentum comes in first. If, the, if U is zero, that happens much later. And um, let's look at the red and blue, sorry, red and black symbols, which are our data um, for the, um, interacting and non-interacting terms. And you can see that is uh, uh, represented in the data as well. Um, the other data are from a, a IBM quantum experience a project, uh, sorry, a quantum experience processor um, that our collaborators ran first, but uh, you can see the data didn't look so promising. This is why they actually um, decided to come to us. I will say though, this is not the latest version. They've actually run this on a newer version of the IBM quantum experience and the data looks um, better. I don't have the plot here yet though. Okay, um, so these are kind of a couple of examples of our first forays into things related to uh, quantum field theory simulations. Um, 
Are there any questions on the chat? Because I'm going to move on to um, emotional mode. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, one of the reasons I called this a quantum architecture is because I said there are other things you can do with the degrees of freedom in an ion uh, other than just using the spin for quantum computing. And so I told you about these motional modes before, um, and these are kind of shared harmonic oscillator modes that look very similar to uh, the modes on a guitar string. Um, but what if I take an ion chain and I just kind of flick one of the ions, okay? What's gonna happen is that ion is going to oscillate, um, but that's not an eigenstate of the system. Sooner or later, the neighbors are gonna notice that the uh, ion is oscillating and some of that oscillation is gonna go to the neighbors. And so one way of describing this system is you can think about individual local harmonic oscillators coupled together. Okay, so here's a way to describe this. Right? You're basically looking at it at a shorter time scale than the, than the uh, uh, characteristic time scale of the normal modes. Um, so here you can see these different harmonic oscillators. This is looking at three ions. So each has its own local harmonic oscillator mode, which you, get, which you can see in this term in the Hamiltonian, maybe with some frequency offset. And then there's a hopping term kappa here, which depends on the distance between these two. Of course, this is they're kind of moving sideways, so it's a bit like a dipole interaction, which is why you have d to the third power. And so this describes hopping in the system. So let's see if it, yeah, if it uh, actually really uh, shows up like this in three ions. So you can see some data. Let's start on the top right here. We put one phonon on ion three, and you can see it hops to ion two and back. It doesn't hop completely, the reason it doesn't hop completely is because of this offset here. They're not quite in resonance, those two oscillators. So it partially hops to ion two. Same if we start a phonon in ion one, it hops to ion two as well. And if we start a phonon in ion two in the middle, you can see we have simultaneous hopping to the left and the right um, of these two. Okay, so this is kind of the free evolution of a phonon hopping in this chain. Looks like a particle hopping between these different oscillators. Um, but at each, side, we don't just have a harmonic oscillator, we also have a spin or a qubit, and we know how to couple those. So um, you can actually turn one of these lasers on and change what the, the states look like here locally. So if you imagine turning on a, uh, a red sideband, which basically connects the spin and the motion, uh, there's new eigenstates here, they're called phonon polariton states. And you can see they are not in resonance with these other states here. So if you put a phonon here, it cannot jump over to this um, site, which is basically blockaded. And so um, you basically add this blockade term to the Hamiltonian, and that means you should be able to prevent hopping to this site by creating this blockade. And so this is what we did. And this is the experimental protocol. We first initialize a phonon on one of the ions. We blockade one, and we see where it hops. And this is kind of a detection step at the end. Okay, so if we start again on the right here, we prepare phonon on ion three hops to ion two, but if we turn the blockade on, you can see it stays on ion three, it doesn't hop. Similarly over here, if we blockade ion two, it stays on ion one. And then in the middle, we can selectively blockade either ion three or ion one and only hop to the ion that is available. And so um, what you see here, all of this data together was, was, you know, there's a fit, but all of these figures are fitted with one set of parameters, which is the uh, different motional mode frequencies and the, um, different uh, Rabi frequencies for the blockade. Um, and so with this set of parameters, uh, we can basically describe this whole system very well, which means this representation that I told you about, this local modes and hopping and interaction is actually a, a very good description of this system. And so there's kind of a, a list of different proposals and ideas that are, you know, some have partially been realized, others are kind of still, um, you know, talked about theoretically of what you could do with this system. And uh, just to pick one out, one is a many phonon uh, system. So this Hamiltonian is called the James Cummings Hubbard system. Um, and with only a few ions, not dozens of ions, but maybe 10 ions and 10 motional modes, um, you can do a simulation that is um, hard to keep track of classically simply because of the size of the Hilbert space. And so I think this is a very promising avenue for using these, these sort of degrees of freedom that are typically not used when you're using uh, ions for a quantum computer. Okay. Um, I'll talk about mm, one more topic that's a little more ex exotic, and I would say it's a little more quantum physics. Um, um, I would say fun with quantum physics, okay? And this is paraparticles. And so um, paraparticles are basically deformations of the standard harmonic oscillator. And so this is the normal commutation relation, and you can deform it by adding, um, you know, a sort of parity operator here. And by um, choosing this new here, you can get either para, para bosons or para fermions of different order. And so this 
parity deformed oscillator then realizes these power particles. And so um, this is the um, Hamiltonian and energies for the normal harmonic oscillator. And in the early days of quantum mechanics, uh, Wigner realized that these deformations are also allowed under the formulation of quantum mechanics and Green identified them with these power particles. And you then get different um, um, Hamiltonians for power bosons and power fermions. And, and so it turns out that um, because of the selection rules involved, they're actually not, they don't appear in nature. So you don't need to describe them, to, uh, to, don't need them to describe nature. They're, it's enough to have power bosons, and power, it's enough to have regular bosons and fermions. Um, but it is still an interesting um, exercise to think about, you know, are there systems with power bosons and fermions and power fermions realized? And so uh, recently there have been some theorists who found out that if you use the, uh, the cross cavity quantum Rabi model, which is basically uh, several bosonic modes coupled to a spin, you can actually create these power oscillators or power particle dynamics. And so it turns out that this system is e exactly realized in a single ion coupled to multiple motion, modes of motion. So what they had in mind is actually two laser beams like this to address them. But it turns out because the motional modes actually align with these blades, you can address both of them with one uh, laser beam direction, which is what we have in my uh, lab. Um, okay, so I'll talk about power bosons first. Um, so in order to do this, um, you need to basically couple this ion to these two motional modes, one uh, in a sort of anti-Jane's Cummings and the other in a Jane's Cummings way. And if you do this, you get a conserved quantity, which basically means the difference between these motional excitations is conserved. And by choosing this number, you can basically choose what is the order of your power boson oscillator. Um, so how would you actually show some power boson dynamics? What would be something interesting to look at that uh, is characteristic? Um, and so uh, here we've chosen to use uh, power boson coherent states, which is similar to a, a coherent state that you get in a regular oscillator, except you now have this um, power boson um, operator that depends on the you know, operators in the ion frame. Um, and if you apply this to the ground state, you can make different uh, power boson coherent states and they have an interesting property. Um, which is that they can have uh, sub or super Poissonian statistics. And depending on the order, you can have a crossing uh, you know, from uh, sub to super Poissonian, which uh, is measured by this so-called Mandel Q parameter. So this is basically the power boson number operator. Um, and uh, if you measure this Mandel Q parameter, you can see this transition as you um, increase P. And so we wanted to do this on an ion trap the problem is there's one condition, which is that these two motional modes have to be equal. And so for the ion trappers in the audience, you know that that's not a great way to run an ion trap because if these two modes are degenerate, it's very hard to cool the ion down and it's not a mode you want to operate. So we kind of took a detour and we decided to run this not as an analog simulation, but actually to create a circuit. And so um, if you map these uh, states here to different spins, um, you can create these parabose raising operators uh, out of uh, spin operators. And it turns out they look like sigma minus sigma plus. So if you multiply this out, they are just sort of different easing interaction terms. And that means without having to trotterize, we can actually run a circuit that creates this parabose coherent state. And so this is what we did. And you can see here the first result, uh, which actually shows this transition from um, sub to super Poissonian in a small uh, parabose system. Okay, so that's kind of the first demonstration. However, you, you know, kind of cheated a little bit because we did it as a circuit. And I told you, we really want to do it with emotional modes. Um, but we can do that on the, uh, on the parafermions. And so the parafermions require that you basically couple a spin to two motional modes, both in this sort of anti-Jane's Cummings interaction, um, which leads to a different conserved quantity. Now, basically the total number of uh, phonons in the system is conserved and um, the difference is you don't no longer have the condition that the two modes have to be degenerate. Um, and so this is the dynamics you expect. So this is if you initialize, for example, 25, uh, you know, box day 25, you expect these oscillations, both of the different um, motional modes and the spin. And so there's this uh, operator in the para fermion frame, um, which basically depends on these two uh, modes in the ion frame uh, that is expected to undergo this dynamics here. Okay, so this is from the theory paper, it goes up to 25. In, in the actual uh, system that we realized we didn't go to 25, we only initialized up to five phonons, but I'll show you how we did that. Um, so in order to prepare phonons, we basically just cool the system down, initialize in the ground state, and then we do these different sideband pulses to create um, 
different Fox states of these harmonic oscillators. And then um, in order to read out what Fox state we're in, we can use the fact that oscillations or that uh, Rabi frequency of uh, the sideband oscillation depends on the Fox state and it goes as square root of n um, plus one. And so here you can see the X mode and Y mode of our ions. This is the Rabi frequency um, for different Fox state numbers. And so it follows pretty well this line. And so if we, for example, initialize a superposition of two Fox states and, and do this oscillation, we get this kind of beating. And if we then fit this to a superposition of different Fox states, we can analyze what the actual states were. And so this gives us, I mean, here we prepare the superposition of zero and one, and that's what we get out. Um, but this gives us a way to, when we run this um, parafermion simulation to detect what are the, um, um, what is the Fox state expectation value in both of our modes. And therefore we can measure, uh, you know, what these operators are. Uh, both in ion frame and then calculate what they are in the parafermion frame. Um, okay, and so I'll show you the first result, which are basically initialize one of the modes in n equals five and the other one in zero. Um, and you get this um, oscillation here. And um, at each point, we can basically fit what the, the occupation number is. And these straight lines here, they are not fits, they are actually simulations. So if you measure what the um, Rabi frequencies in the system are, this is what the expected dynamics is. So this is not a fit. It is basically just from the experimental parameters what we expect the dynamics to be. And you can see they match pretty well. And so this is in the ion frame and we can then calculate this observable in the parafermion frame. And um, you can also see again that the, the dynamics are pretty uh, nicely reproduced. And so this is basically the first ever uh, realization of a parafermion um, um, dynamics in a, a physical system. You're gonna ask me, what is it useful for? I don't know yet, but it's kind of nice that we're able to realize it. And there's a good use of our, of our emotional modes to do some uh, quantum physics simulation. Okay, um, I will move on to the kind of uh, conclusions or outlooks, uh, unless there's questions. Okay. Um, uh, uh, one question, please. So, uh, I was interested in the trotterization for the Schwinger uh, yep. simulation. So, how, uh, so if you increase the trotterization steps, then you will get arbitrarily correct, right? So how do you choose the number of trotterization steps? Yeah, so the, the, it's a trade-off. So you can see here, we, the trotter step that we chose for this single side model matches very closely the exact solution, okay? Um, so there, we didn't really make a big compromise. But then as we move to bigger, um, as we move to bigger systems, um, the problem is there's a trade-off between the trotter error. If you want to keep the trotter error small, you need to do more gates. But if you do more gates, you're going to get a bigger experimental error. And so here, by looking at this theoretically, kind of looking at that trade-off, you know, if you imagine doing smaller steps, that means the blue or red spot dots will follow this exact line more precisely. However, in reality, you will probably not um, reproduce that uh, um, dynamics in the experiment because the error is so big. And so this kind of represents a compromise between trotter error and experimental error. And so by doing this, we're able to basically reproduce three flops um, of this oscillation. Um, if you do, if you take a uh, smaller trotter step, you can probably, uh, you know, you can only reproduce it for a shorter time. And so that's kind of a trade-off. And that trade-off gets easier if your gate error gets better, but there is still room for optimization by um, optimizing what choices you make in this trotterization, right? How you order these terms uh, can also make a difference in how well um, the, the real dynamics mat, um, matches the um, dynamics you measure. Lauren Warren has a question. Norbert, is there a mapping between these parafermi oscillators and the uh, infinite rotational ladders in parahydrogen? Um, I'm afraid I don't know. Okay, well, we can um, talk later. I've not thought about that. Um, maybe we can, yeah. That sounds okay. like one to hold for later. <laughs> yeah, maybe let's talk about it later. Um, yeah. Interesting uh, thought, maybe, yeah. I, I do have a very mundane question. Um, yeah. In, in one of your plots uh, showing the parafermion or para boson results, um, you had error bars on the plot it was the orange and blue. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. It's, uh, 
it's here. Yes. What What is the meaning of those? Uh, they are just statistical error bars based on the number of repetitions we did in the experiment. So um, this does not include um, errors in the gates, for example. So it's just from finite sampling. That's what these error bars are. I see. So so they don't they're not supposed to explain necessarily all this difference here. Uh, right? So because we have gate errors, there's a real difference here for para boson order zero. There should be Mandel Q parameter zero, but we, we find one. And that's because when we do all these gates, um, there are some errors that accumulate. And so we don't reproduce this dynamics exactly. Uh, but it's pretty clear that we do see this transition, which is what we wanted to reproduce. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can proceed with your last topic. Yeah, um, it's very quick. It's about scaling up and improvements. OK, so I made a big deal about the fact that we have this fully connected system, which is so great. But of course, the truth is no system will be fully connected at arbitrary sizes. So at some point, wiggling ion one is not going to be efficient in order to entangle it with ion n, OK? And so at that point, what you do, there's different options. One is you might be able to split the chain. So you have a fully connected chain over here. You use some fancy ion trap that can actually do split and merge, and you're going to have fully connected chain over here. So overall, your system is still going to be pretty densely connected, even though not fully connected. And then maybe you request a remote entanglement resource, which connects these modules together via these entangled photons. But this creates, of course, what I call the compilation challenge, which means now your compiler, previously I showed you a compiler that was very simple. It was just a lookup table, right? Run a Fredkin, look up these gates. But here the compiler has can make choices on the structure of the computer. Right? It can choose where to split, when to split, where to move, when to move, when to request this. And so all of these will have trade-offs involved, right? And so therefore, um, the compiler will have to sort of grow in complexity and sophistication as these systems grow. And this is kind of a challenge that is that is coming up. Um, in either uh, way, though, it's important to have you know to optimize the the um, gates within this uh, you know within one chain. And for that reason, I was kind of looking at what is the biggest limitation to our performance. So. Uh, Joshua just asked, you know, where does the error come from? And the biggest error for us is these two qubit gates. And they are bad because the ions are not perfectly positioned and the beams partially miss them, which makes it very sensitive to uh, vibrations, which means we don't do these gates perfectly. They're partially entangled with the motion. And that leads to, we don't measure the motion in a quantum computing scenario. And that leads to a little bit of a mixed state. And so this is our current blade trap. One alternative is uh, traps that, um, Jung Sang Kim, uh, Chris Monroe, and others are currently using, which are these surface traps, which have the electrodes lithographically defined in a plane, um, which is nice because they're very precisely made. It, have, it has downsides too. One of them is that you now have your ions very close to a surface, which makes you more sensitive to surface noise, charging, and so on. It restricts your optical access from some directions. So what I would really like is a trap like this, but perfectly engineered, OK? not like aligned by hand with a grad by a graduate student. Currently, our trap is misaligned like this and like this, and we, we can see effects from all of these. So what I'd like is what I call the Michelangelo style fabrication. So you take a, you take a, uh, you know, Michelangelo would say you take a rock, you remove everything that's not a statue. So can you take a single piece and remove everything that's not an ion trap? And it turns out you can. This is a company called Transloom in Michigan, and they make this, uh, they have this fabrication process in fused silica. So they write into a fused silica slab a structure, and the, the part that is exposed to um, light etches faster than the non-exposed part. And with this, they can make these intricate structures in uh, three dimensions. And so the idea would be you make a trap like this, which has all the nice properties that I like, which is high optical access, low heating rates, uh, good control over these ions. Um, but you make it out of one piece so that each electrode is registered to each other one in 3D to within one micron over several millimeters. And so this trap doesn't exist yet, but test pieces exist. So you can see here a sort of um, a test piece, also with some microscope image that shows you these things are very well symmetric. And um, also the fabrication tolerance down to one micron is actually achievable. Um, another challenge is, of course, how do you cold it with gold? And so you can see some tests here. Um, and a sort of close-up picture of the kind of structures that are doable. So this is not an ion trap yet. You can see none of these are actually connected to the outside world. At the moment, it's just a um, process to basically see that we can make these things uh, as precisely as we need. And in a next step, um, 
later this year, we expect to get a sort of first test piece that we're going to mount and connect like this and actually see if we can uh, trap the first ions in it and uh, basically do another step in control over both the ions for gates, but also if you have a trap that's very well symmetric, you get very symmetric local motional modes, which are important for these simulations that I've been saying, uh, mentioning. Okay, very last point is that I'm also working on a uh, project for quantum networking. And so in quantum networking, we have the problem that anything that's a good quantum processor like ions typically works with UV or visible photons. They might be able to send out entangled photons or photons entangled with the ions. Um, but in order to really do a, a network over larger distances, you want to be near telecom frequencies. And the common uh, approach here is frequency conversion. Uh, but I thought maybe there's another way to think about this, uh, which is if you have a node um, and you have some choice where you put the next node, this red circle means this is how far you could go if you had the perfect wavelength, 1550. Uh, but if you don't have the perfect wavelength, there's another circle, uh, which is, well, if your next node is not too far away, uh, so that your fiber loss is actually smaller than conversion loss, uh, it's good to actually use the photons that are coming out of the ion directly without converting. So how big is this circle? Well, if you're, if you're using UV photons, the circle is your lab. If you're using visible photons, the circle is maybe your building or you know, the next building over. Um, but what is, you know, here you see fiber loss versus wavelength. What would be the shortest wavelength that is still sensible to use? And I would argue it's around here, 1100 nanometers, because then you have these peaks and it doesn't really get better. This is the global minimum, of course. And here's another minimum that's also often used, 1300. Okay, so around 1100, I would say, if you find an ion there that sends out entangled photons, you know, that's a, a useful thing for a medium distance quantum network over a few kilometers. And it turns out there is such a transition in strontium ions at 1092, very close to 1100 nanometers. And the way you could create entanglement is by exciting to this state um, and collect the photons from this decay. And you can see here one decay is sigma minus polarization goes to state one, sigma plus to state zero. So you have an entangled state between the ion state, between the ion and the polarization of the photon. And so for this, I'm building um, with a couple of my students a new trap, which is just a very simple um, four rod trap to demonstrate this process on a single ion. And so this is a um, a sketch, of course, and um, since this week, there's also a real trap uh, on the table. You can see it in the center here. And so hopefully in the next few months, we'll be able to trap strontium ions and start working on this project. Okay, um, this is basically it. There's a few people I want to thank. Um, <clears throat> I'll start with, of course, my group. Um, I have a number of really great graduate students, particularly Cynthia, who actually joined my lab as a theorist from Mexico, who did all this theory work on the power of particles and who over the last couple of years managed to actually um, become an expert in the lab and pull off these paraparticle simulations. Um, Ying Ye is working on the scattering process with uh, Yannick Maurice, who's pictured down here. And Jung is working on the Schwinger model simulation with Zore. Um, and um, Denton and Mika are working on the strontium experiment. And um, uh, my student, uh, my postdoc, Elena, is kind of working on all of these. And Unji is kind of starting on the, the glass trap. And here are some external collaborators, Zore, Yannick, uh, Blas, who did the theory on the paraparticles, uh, Chandru from India, who did the theory on the quantum box, and I'm working with Guido on the, uh, on the glass trap fabrication. And thanks to uh, funding agencies and uh, Chris, who's been a, a very great mentor over the past uh, uh, years. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Norbert. Um, we um, had a very, very nice talk. Um, and I, I, I'm always disappointed that we can't really give a round of applause, but you, you have to imagine it, I suppose. <laughs> it just doesn't work on Zoom. Um, we usually start our question and answer period by giving um, graduate students or undergraduate students an opportunity to ask the, the first questions before everybody else jumps in. So are, are there any students who would like to ask a question? You can do it using the raise hand function or just speak up. Don't be too shy. Evan Reed. 
Hi, Dr. Linka. Um, I was just wondering if you could uh, say again what exactly the phonon polariton state is and how exactly you implement the, the pho phonon blockade. Yes, sorry, I, I did this pretty quickly, I guess. I'll go back. Um, yeah. Okay, so here you just have the, the in this system, you just have a, a local harmonic oscillator. That's the only degree of freedom. Okay, let's see. Here's the, uh, here's the Hamiltonian. Okay, so you have these uh, harmonic oscillators and they're just coupled. That's basically the Hamiltonian. If you now introduce a laser beam that couples these harmonic oscillator states to the spin that is currently not at all in this Hamiltonian, right? You're kind of um, coupling a unrelated Hilbert space to this. So you're adding this term here. You can see this has spin and motion terms in it. And it has a, a Rabi frequency, which is related to the laser intensity that you apply. You get these new eigenstates here. Um, and so they're called phonon polariton states. And you can see the splitting here depends not just on the frequency of the harmonic oscillator. It also depends on the laser intensity that you apply here. Um, and therefore, you can choose basically where this level is. And therefore, you can basically shift it out of resonance so that no phonon can jump onto here. Um, you can also use this in another way. If you imagine applying this everywhere, you could put some of them in resonance and some out of resonance, and you can create delocalized phonons. Um, that's another. That's one. That's on the list here somewhere uh, of possible applications. Um, but this is—is uh, is it here somewhere? Delocalized phonons. Yeah. Uh, Diego Porras from Spain suggested this. Um, so this means there's a you know there's kind of a a a system of local. Um, states that are under your control, which is kind of what makes this an interesting system. I see. Great. Thank you. Other questions from students? Whoa. Let, let's open it up to everybody then. Questions? Warren, did you want to follow up on, on your question about uh, hydrogen? Um, no, I'm not sure it's worth a follow up at this point. I'll try to email separately with Norbert and we can okay. have a discussion. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm very happy to look for potential applications of the paraparticles. It's kind of more a fun quantum physics exploration at this point. So uh, other paraparticles like um, um, anions and so on have found uh, applications in the quantum Hall effect physics. Um, for this kind, parity deformed ones, um, I don't think there's, a, there's any kind of physical system that this, that's being described by it. So I'm, I'm curious if there's ideas. I have a question for, for Norbert. This is yeah. uh, so in your strontium um, experiment with the 10, 10, oh, 10, well, 92, yeah, yeah. 92 nanometer photon. Um, once the photon is emitted, what degree are you planning to use the polarization degree of freedom? And yeah. in that case, what is the resulting atomic state? And how, how do you deal with uh, the resulting atomic state? Um, <laughs> The resulting atomic state is uh, here, yeah. basically the superposition of these two. Um, yeah. And so there's two ways of dealing with it. One is you could just say, this is my qubit. Yeah. Um, and to first, for first demonstrations, you would. Um, but of course, maybe not a great qubit. Um, so one, um, one way of doing it is you could map it to a ground level qubit if mm -hmm. you have this, uh, this quadrupole transition available. right? Yeah. Um, um, or as an optical qubit, if you just move one of them down. Um, another way is you could work here directly. So there's two ways. One is you could uh, drive this with microwaves. Mm -hmm. So you're going to say, well, is this possible? <laughs> it turns out it's not allowed because it's delta m equals two. Yeah. And so that's a Zeeman Zeeman qubit. Yeah, it's a Zeeman qubit. Yeah. So it will be magnetic field sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, so you might have to put it if you really want to use it for uh, bigger experiments. You might want to put it in a uh, new metal box. Uh, this is what I've seen um, in Ben Lanyon's group in Innsbruck. They have this uh, calcium experiment where they use this kind of this transition up here. I think it's 800 something in calcium. They, so they've boxed up their experiment in a, in a new metal 
uh, kind of shelf uh, to deal with it. Um, okay. And that D three half state that you end up in, what what is the lifetime, natural lifetime in? Um, it's a it's a about a um, little less than a second, I think, uh, okay. nine hundred milliseconds or something like that. Um, so this is why if you want to use it as a resource and make many, you may want to map it down to the ground level. Um, this is not something I've planned here because it's kind of expensive to get this laser going as well. I sure. don't think you need it for the first demonstration, but I think that's definitely a concern if you want to keep it for longer. Okay. Um, Thank you. There's yeah. also a, an odd isotope strontium 87, which actually has a clock state pair at a certain magnetic field. So you could imagine combining it with that. Yeah, I mean, you you you, can, you don't want to map it to the ground. The ground state is also a Zeeman qubit, right? Um, yeah. That is true, but you can at least drive transitions easier. Um, yeah. I guess if you use if you use strontium eighty seven, in this case, you have a clock state in the uh, in the ground level. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Or if you want to entangle it, maybe you want to just use it for a short period of time, and you have some kind of, uh, for example, the calcium strontium um, gate that was done in Oxford. Uh, that is definitely between two ground state qubits. So if you want to map that uh, phonon entangled degree of freedom to another ion that you use for computation, it's better to be in the ground state. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks. So I'd like to ask a question. I'm, I'm having trouble formulating it in simple terms, but it's... it's um, it's a question about how you choose the problems that you're going to work on. Yeah. What, what, what makes a problem interesting to you? Is it, is it that there are particular quantum uh, sort of theoretical problems that you would like to solve? Is it that you simply want to demonstrate that you can do something with a quantum computer that people can't do otherwise? Is it so the AMO physics that, that determines what's most interesting? So How do you pick little, your problems? Yeah, I guess a little bit of everything. So you're asking if, if someone comes with a, you know, with a potential algorithm, how do I select from there? And it turns out some, when we did talk, talk about it, some are impossible on our system to do. Some are maybe not that interesting, but I like to do things that inspire us to improve our system or learn something about our system. And with the Schwinger model, we learned about um, how to do this um, term ordering in trotterized trotter uh, simulations, that's very useful. We learned how to uh, take advantage of these symmetries in the system. And we were actually inspired to improve our um, controller because we didn't have enough memory to run these deep circuits. Okay. So at the same time as the, you know, the theory collaborator gets a simulation that they are interested in, we're also learning about our system and being motivated to improve our system. And so I would say these are the most interesting ones where we, where we you know, where we have a synergistic effect from, uh, from running this. Henry Everett, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Hey Norbert, um, enjoyed your talk. Um, I, I want to give you a chance to respond to something that came out very recently. You've probably seen this that the Chinese group um, demonstrated a quantum supremacy demonstration using this big interferometer on boson sampling, and I, I'd like to give you a chance to kind of react to those kinds of toy demonstrations just to show quantum supremacy versus the hard work that it takes to go build a practical quantum computer that solves real problems we care about. Yeah. So boson sampling is an interesting one because the bar for boson sampling always rises, right? Every few years, someone comes up with a better classical algorithm for boson sampling. Um, and so the question is how scalable is the, the quantum system versus the classical system. But ultimately, I don't think it's a bad idea to do a quantum supremacy experiment because it's another motivation, right, to push your system to where it's eventually be useful. It's important, though, to not kind of overvalue the uh, achievement of a quantum supremacy result that is sort of arbitrary, right? Uh, another one that comes to mind is the Google result. Right? If you pick kind of a random output, you show that it's hard to sample. And of course, that is also true for some classical problems, right? If you take a wind tunnel and you put a lot of metal pieces in various configurations, you also do something that is not classically calculable. Um, so that's why I kind of like to benchmark or use our systems uh, in collaboration with real applications, even though they're not yet quantum supreme or they are not, I mean, useful quotation marks, yeah? But they represent the use case that you would actually want a quantum computer uh, you know, to be used for. And to me, that's more interesting than running a random circuit or maybe even a benchmarking problem of all the sub pieces. Um, because, you know, I don't know, just because it's more fun, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good motivation, but um, that's kind of how we've been doing it. 
uh, in the recent years. Other questions? I actually have a quick question. Um, thanks for the talk. It was really, really interesting. I enjoy um, learning about uh, these different uh, quantum uh, computing and simulation methods. And I just have a really general question about quantum simulators and specifically their advantage, potential advantage in certain situations over sort of a traditional quantum computer. Um, so like one of the problems that it seems like a quantum simulator might be more suitable to address is ones in which there's sort of a significant thermal bath involved or something that would induce significant non-unitary dynamics on some or all of the qubits. Um, just because sometimes non-unitary dynamics, it seems a little awkward to implement them using only unitary operations. And um, I was just wondering if you could comment on any possible advantages for a quantum simulator in cases where um, there's significant non-unitary dynamics, such as condensed phase reaction dynamics, for instance. So, yeah, I would say it's not necessarily easy to engineer a thermal bath also in a quantum simulator. Uh, because you're still going to initialize it in some quantum state and um, it's hard to kind of have a controlled thermalization right especially here we have these harmonic oscillator modes yes they start hot and we cool them down but to initialize them in a particular temperature as a particular temperature bath is hard i mean we've done it on a um on the quantum computer basically by a method that's called a thermal field double state so you basically create an entangled system between A and B, if you trace out B, you can leave a partially mixed state in system A. And by um, choosing the degree of entanglement in the beginning, you can choose the degree of mixedness or the, the temperature, if you like, of system B. And so that is a good resource for quantum simulations. And because you initialize it in a thermal state, the problem is you need to make it twice in order to do that. So that's kind of costly. Um, and so I think quantum simulators are particularly strong where the sort of the Hamiltonian that, that they naturally present matches the problem that you're interested in. So this is why this parafermion simulation that Cynthia came up with is so efficient, because even though it's just one ion, it uses all of these motional states, and they represent exactly the Hamiltonian that you want to, to make the parafermion. And just for fun, she also mapped the same problem to a circuit. And even though we used five ions instead of one, we couldn't nearly get the, the evolution, right, that we got with one ion and these motional modes. And that shows you how powerful it is if you can match the, uh, the problem to an analog simulator. So you should always do that if you can. The problem is they're not general purpose. Right? And this is kind of, um, I don't know, but it's better if, if you can add additional degrees of freedom, you will expand the space of potential applications that you can match. And this is why I think it's a good idea to include the, the harmonic oscillator modes in the simulations. Um, what's nice about the quantum computer is if you have some coupling that you don't really get in, a, in the system naturally, like a Heisenberg coupling that a lot of these field theories need, well, you can make it by doing X and Y and Z separately. Um, but maybe even there you can do some tricks. So we're currently working on a way to make X and Y simultaneously. Maybe we can cut down some of these at least by a factor of two. Um, but that's kind of what I would say. Great, thanks. Well, actually, can I can I add one more thing? Just it, it just seems interesting that it's interesting that that you say that because it's it sounds like if I understand what you're saying that um uh, that these sort of non-unitary dynamics are also not supernatural on a quantum architecture mm -hmm. like you described. Yeah. Um. So it's just interesting to me because um. It doesn't seem like there's any architecture, uh, you know, class because classical computers also aren't too good at it, depending on how strong the quantum effects are. Um, well, there'd be a lot of interesting yeah. problems you could study with, like, let's say you take two separate thermalized systems that are at different temperatures, and then you put them on an interface with some quantum system in the middle um, and study the non-Markovian effects of the overall dynamics, um, that would seems like a question that would be, that it's just sort of universally hard to address. I think when the quantum system is big enough so that the system that you're studying is small compared to the overall system, I think that's when you'll be able to do that because then the other system can really act as a bath. Um, yeah. Thanks.
So let's let's thank Norbert again for for a lovely talk, um, and uh, we can have him stay on for a few more minutes if if some people want to hang out. But but we can sort of officially bring the formal part of the colloquium to a close here. So thanks everybody for joining us. Remember, February 10th at noon would be the next colloquium. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you.